Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let's start our service with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as the sun shines through these windows, we are reminded of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask right now that you would pour out your spirit upon this place, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. Lord, thank you for calling us to be a people of worship with our eyes on you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As Kelly and Thomas come forward for our opening song, I encourage you to open your hymnals to hymn number 3333. Immortal, invincible, God only wise. Please stand. Immortal, invincible, God only wise. In light and accessible, in from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as night. Nor wanting, nor wasting. Thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all thy thou givest, to both great and small, in all thy thou livest, the true life of all, thy wisdom so boundless, thy mercy so free, eternal thy goodness, for not changes me. We're going to do verse 4 too, and I know I messed up. Let's do verse 4 in the Great Father of glory, your Father of light, thy angels adore thee, all bearing their sight. All praise we would render, oh, help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light high and clean. Please be seated. It is Father's Day, and so to the fathers who are here, I... I wish you a happy, blessed Father's Day. One of the struggles that, that I often have as, as an elder throughout the course of the year is when we come to those civic and what I'm going to call hallmark holidays. A civic holiday is one like Fourth of July or, or Memorial Day weekend. Now those are important days. Mother's Day and Father's Day, those are important days. If those days draw our attention away from worship. That would be a bad thing. On 4th of July, we ought to thank our God for the gift of this nation. On Mother's Day, we ought to thank our God for the gift of our mothers. And on Father's Day, we should look at our Father in Heaven, who is the perfect Father, the Abba, the Daddy, and say thank you so much. And Father's Day and Mother's Day and days like that, for some, are joyous days. For others, they're a little painful. Perhaps mom was not the mom she ought to have been, or dad was not the dad he ought to have been. Perhaps there's a, a woman who would love to be a mom and was never a mom, or a dad who never became a dad, but he wanted to be. And so these days are days filled with great stress and pain and struggle. But knowing that we have a sovereign, loving Father in heaven yes, Lord. who loved us so much that he gave his son Jesus Christ that we might have a family with him and gave us the spirit to testify to our hearts the truth and reality that we are adopted children of God. Amen. Even the most difficult, painful of days can be a day where there's still joy. 
So this morning we are here to worship. We're going to celebrate the dads that are in our midst, the dads that were in our lives and perhaps are now home in heaven. But we are truly celebrating our Father in heaven, our Abba, the one whose love is perfect love. A number of quick announcements this morning. Um, we have a busy schedule, even for a small church in the midst of the end of this COVID season. And so I don't know if you've ever really looked at the back of the bulletins, but I encourage you to do that, to look and see things that you might be involved in. I joked last week about my own family having a family breakfast and a family dinner time and how important that is to us to keep us as a family, as a church family. Look for those opportunities of fellowship. Look for those opportunities of connecting with one another. If the only time we see each other is, is Sunday in worship, that's wonderful. But that's not building the relationships between us. So look for those opportunities. There are men's breakfast Bible studies. There are ladies' Bible studies. There are barbecues. There are times of, of doing things together that's working side by side, fixing up the church. I encourage you to look at what's going on and be challenged and say, you know what? Maybe that wasn't for me, but it ought to be. And I'm going to step into it, not because I need that thing so much, but I need the family, the fellowship, the body of Christ. And your presence builds that. So that's my main announcement this morning. Relationships. And I'm going to share one last thing. Most of you know my kids are much older than, than little ones nowadays. My kids all, almost all tower over me. Well, I sat with a gentleman recently who was involved in my kids' lives. He was here for a while, and he's not here now. And I shared something with him. By not being here, you are robbing my sons of a Christian man's example. If you don't come for yourself, that's fine. Come to worship the Father in heaven and to touch the lives of the people around you. Amen. When you are not present, okay, it's not about you. It's about worship and adoration and service and touching lives. So we are going to pause for a moment and ask God that he would draw us together as his family, for he is our father. Father, we live in a culture that's all about us. We live in a culture that is all about our likes and dislikes and wants and pleasures. And that has crept into the church. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke that. And we are reminded that as your children, we are called, every one of us, not just elders and deacons, to be the hands and feet and voice of Christ. Sometimes, Lord, just being present is all you require. So when our brother or sister is in grief and we have no words to say, just being present and sitting with them is comfort. Sometimes when our young people are somewhat lost in this world, being present in their lives is enough to lay the foundation of faith and a walk with you. Find us, Lord, faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Fourth of July, Fourth of July. Charles is reminding us that on 4th of July, which falls on Sunday, there has been a tradition in Circleville. And I'll tell something real fast. Many, 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 many years ago, Circleville, actually, this church started the 4th of July parade in this town. 
It was a bunch of little kids from the church who dressed up their bicycles and they made a little 4th of July parade. And the next year it caught on a little more, and the next year it caught on a little more. It was little boys that were in the Sunday school, and little girls that were in the Sunday school, and now it happens to be a huge, huge fireman's parade. And it's known all over the place because we have more fire trucks than I can count. I can count pretty good. Um, this year it's on Sunday, and so they have decided not to have the parade on Sunday because they want to respect the churches. That's pretty cool in our culture today. So on Saturday, the 3rd of July, at 9 o'clock in the morning, over at the school over here, there's going to be a big meeting of people, and you don't need to sign up. And everybody kind of congregates and figure out you know, who's going to march with who and for what reason. And then at about 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock is the step off. There's a semi-short parade. It's down the one road and right in front of the church here. Uh, down 302 and into the park. So it's not that long of a walk. That means most of you can do it. And we end at the park. Well, Charles is reminding me because one of the things that our church believes in is the sanctity of life. And Charles and Ella May and a set of individuals from Orange County every year march in that parade, respecting and honoring the sanctity of life, the unborn child. Amen. Now, our church has normally had a vacation Bible school float. And because of COVID and everything else, this year we've still felt we were going to probably put that on hold. But that doesn't mean we as a church should not be representing the gospel in that parade. Representing the presence of the light of Jesus Christ in that parade. So I encourage, if you want to get together with a set of people and trail life, if you want to get together with a set of people uh, with the uh, right to life uh, a movement, or even a set of people from Circleville as a church. Upward. Upward basketball. We have so many things that we do in this community to be light of the gospel. Let's not hide it under a bushel. And so I challenge you to be there. And I'll make you feel guilty for a moment. Saturdays, my day starts at 2.30 in the morning at the store. I run out at 6 o'clock in the morning to do stuff with church. I'll be going to the parade, marching in the parade. At 2 o'clock, i got to be at back at the store, and I stay usually till 8 or 11 o'clock at night. And please don't go, well, Jim, you shouldn't be a pastor then because you work too hard. I, I appreciate your love, but if God calls me to love him, let me love him. If I can do that, some of you can be on the sidelines of the parade encouraging others, and some of you can march. Please be a witness in this community, and one option certainly can be the Orange County Right to Life. Anyone else this morning? Or an announcement I may have forgotten. For those who couldn't hear, um, Jamie's reminding us the brand new floor is arriving on June 28th for the New Life Center. Everything's been paid for. It is fully paid for. What a blessing. Um, and this week, our plan is to start ripping up the old floor. It comes up easy, but it's a big floor. So if during this week you have any time, speak with Jamie. Um, more, probably more towards the end of the week it's going to happen. But uh, we are planning to rip up that whole floor and cart most of it, much of it to the dumpster, uh, pile what we can in a corner and get it ready for the next empty dumpster. But uh, that part we need to do as a church family ourselves. And so if you are semi-young, under 80, 90, you know, um, uh, well, because I watched, I watched Don work, so I know that Don can do it. So anyway, if you are able, we would love to have your help. Anyone else this morning? Very good. In your bulletins, there is an insert. And for this, I'd like to ask that you remain seated. But it's a Father's Day responsive reading that comes right out of Scripture. I will read the portion that's not bolded, and I will ask that you join with me as we read together the portion that is bolded. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, 
and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that they did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now, and what will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to ask if Kelly and Thomas would come forward. And while they're coming forward, if you would turn in your hymnals to page 143. 143. This is my father's world. Please stand. This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings that around me rings the music of the spheres. This
cappella, just to close this time of praise. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. So that I can focus on God's word. Yes, so that I can see the spirit of God. And perhaps you're in that same boat. Perhaps there are mornings that you come to church. And there are things that are going on that distract. Let's pause for a moment of silence. So that we can see our God. Father, you are a good, good Father. Yes, you are. So as we come to your word, holy, written, inspired, and errant, let us hear your voice. Mm -hmm. Testify to our hearts through your spirit. Let us see your face. Yes, Lord. Lord, hide not yourself from us this morning. For some, we need our spirits lifted with encouragement. For others, we might need a word of discipline, accountability. But, oh Lord, how wonderful it is that you are a good, good Father. Yes, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our first passage of Scripture this morning. It's found in the book of Proverbs. Now, we're going to be reading two passages of Scripture. And God's Word is full of encouragements and reminders of how we ought to live, how we ought to have relationships, how we ought to treat one another. Some relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. Some relationships between fathers and children and mothers and children. And this morning, as it's Father's Day, we're going to look at the relationship of a father to his children, of a, of a mentor, a, a male role model, to those who need, boys and girls who need that male role model. Proverbs chapter 22, starting at verses 1 through 6. And verse 6 is normally the only verse that we read, but I'd like us to read verses 1 through 6. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple goes on and suffers for it. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far away from them. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
And our next passage of scripture this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them to your teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and shall be a frontal between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. As I shared with you this morning, I'm having kind of a rough morning. I have things that are in my head that are bouncing all over, and so I'm forgetting some things. And I see that we do have some little ones or young people here this morning, and so if you are about junior high age or so, I'd like you to come down here by me for a moment. So junior high, right on down to, uh, to, to little ones, if you guys can come down here, because I've got something I want to show you, which does fit with our sermon message, so it kind of fits, but I should have done that before reading the scripture. So as they're making their way down, it's been a long time since I've done this, so hopefully I figure out how to do it right. Just take a seat right here. Good morning, guys. Right up here, guys. Thank you. Right there, bud. All right. So what does Mr. Jim have in his hands? Balloons. And I'm going to end up dropping them all over the place, and that's okay. Tell me something about these balloons. They're long. All right. Anything else that you can tell? What's that? They're made of rubber. Are they all the same? No, they're a little different. You know what? Different colors. You got it. You know, you guys are all a little different, right? And they're kind of pretty cool colors. I like that. You know, they're pretty cool looking, right? You guys are pretty cool looking. Well, Mr. Jim's going to try me something. We'll see how it works. I used to be able to blow these up by just going. I don't think I can do that anymore. I, you might be able to, but I can tell you, these are very difficult to blow up. So let's see if this little thing works. Oh, look at that. Life is much easier now. <laughs> now, your dads have a job to do. Your dads have a job to train you up in the way of the Lord. Now, every one of you is pretty cool. Every one of you is a little different, but you know what? You have such potential. You could be something special. You already are. Mm -hmm. But God has a plan for your life, and it's your dad's job to help you become something that God wants you to be. Sometimes the kids don't always listen.
in your sight. May they be shaped and molded by the fathers and the men in their lives so that they might be the image bearers of Jesus. In your name, amen. You guys go back to your seats. After our service, by the way, we have a coffee hour, and if you guys each want a balloon, I'll make them a little quicker. Yes. Yes. Today, in our culture, Satan has begun to loom very large. There was a time when community, families, churches, had such influence over the culture that you knew darkness was darkness and light was light. You knew that that family over there who had alcoholic parents and whatever, that that was a bad thing. and It was obvious to everybody. But today, in our culture, leadership, even churches at times, are calling evil good and good evil. And because of that, Instead of light and darkness, there's lots of gray. Our families are under attack. Fathers are scolded for being fathers. Mothers are scolded for being mothers. It is more the culture that wants to raise our children, the, the school systems and the politics and beyond the family. The values that mom and dad and grandma and grandpa want to impart to their children are often seen to be counter to what is politically, educationally correct. It is not the school's job to teach your children values. Right. It is not the community's job to train your children up in the way of the Lord. For I will tell you, if you let the school do that, when they are old, they will not depart from it. If you let the community and the culture train up the children of the church, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs. Proverbs starts out with basic advice 
to a father. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. What does it mean by a good name? And favor is better than silver or gold. Now favor is not, oh, we like him. Quite honestly, Jesus made it very clear that if you are living for him, the culture may not like you. What is it that favor is referring to? What is it that a good name Perhaps because we follow God's word, perhaps because we stand on the precepts, the law of God, the community will not respect us. What does it mean that a good name, favor, it means character. It means character, godly character, character that is built on the person of Jesus Christ, character that is built on emulating who Jesus was in this world. And if that means somebody hates you because of it, so be it. But do you waffle? Do you waffle because, well, one day this person likes you, and the other day this person says something, and so you also want to make them happy, and so where does your votes come from? No, I'm not talking about Republican or Democrat, but I'm implying it. Where do your votes come from? Well, I'll do what it takes to get voted in. That's not character, my friends. That's opportunistic. Do you have the character of Christ? And when people came to Christ and they said, Lord, Lord. And he spoke to them and loved them and healed them and fed them. The feeding of the 5,000. When a woman comes in. And takes a jar of expensive perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet. There was love there, and there, there was love in Jesus' heart there. But there was also individuals who looked at Jesus with contempt in their heart, with guile in their heart. Jesus didn't change his message. To make the Pharisees happy and like him. Jesus didn't change his message to make the Gentiles like him or the Jews like him or the women like him or the men like him. Jesus' message was God's message. And the church's message is God's message. And your message in your households to your children and your grandchildren and the children of the church. Because do you realize that when we baptize a child... Yes, I know not everybody in Christendom does the same kind of baptism. Some people it's adult baptism and you dunk and some people it's infant baptism and you sprinkle. But in our church, we understand the covenant being when this child is brought before the congregation, we make a covenant that that mom and that dad and this church, this body makes a covenant that that child is a priority in our life. And we trust that God is going to change that child's heart. And we are going to be faithful instruments of God pouring into that child's life what they need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if we fail in that, we have failed God. If we fail in that, we have failed our promise to God, our covenant to God. What a blessing it is that God doesn't fail. We do. But God doesn't. What does it mean that a good name is to be sought after? What does it mean that favor is to be sought after? Better than riches, it's your character. Are you one person in church and somebody completely different at home? Are you somebody in a Bible study one way, but at work you are completely different? Well, I have to tell you, then there's a problem with your character. It's wrong. If the language you use, if the attitudes you carry are different. Now, I'm not talking about a good day and a bad day. If you have a bad day at work and you have a bad day at home, it's okay. It happens. If you have a good day, and that happens. I'm talking about your character, who you are. 
We are not somebody that a switch should be turned on and off. That when we're in church, we are pious and holy. And when we're at home, we're at ease. And oh, is God around? Yeah, I'm the man. Oh, it's dinner time. We'll pray now. But the rest of the evening is an evening of whatever. What is your character? Train up a child in the way of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, if we as a church do not train up our children, our young people, we will leave that to someone else. And that individual, more than likely, is not being led by the spirit of the living God, but instead is being lived led by the spirits of this world, by demonic forces, and they will take every opportunity to infect and infest the lives of our children. Our families are under attack. And I don't think most of us even realize it. Our families, Satan has a plan for it. And instead of us realizing that it is an imminent battle, we find it instead annoying. My friends, something that annoys you is not really a threat. Something that gets under your skin a little bit is not a threat. Our children are being threatened. And are we standing as a church, as parents, as adults? The rich and the poor meet together, and the Lord is the maker of them all. The rich and poor meet together, and the Lord is the maker of them all. Our God is sovereign, my friends. There is not anyone who is not under the hand of our God. And our children are his gifts. But we have been called to task. We are being reminded in verse 2 that God is the maker. God is the sustainer. God is the creator. God alone is the one who we ought to have our eyes on. We have been in the midst of a summer series on Elijah and Elisha. And if you notice, we're not reading out of Kings today. And so we've taken a break for Father's Day to, to look at these passages. But in the day of Elijah and in the day of Elisha, there was a battle for the hearts and minds of, of the people that God had chosen God is still over Ahab, whether he knows it or not. This past year when we went through Daniel, God was still over Nebuchadnezzar, whether he acknowledged it or not. Our culture does not realize who sits on the throne, but we do. Here we have a, a passage of scripture that is calling out again to remind us that every child, every human being is under God. Now, yesterday during our session meeting with the elders, we looked at something that was kind of interesting. Often in scripture there are two concepts that are paired together describing God. One is his justice. One is his righteousness, his holiness. And the other is his love and his mercy, his steadfast love, his covenant love. Those are two very different things. We read that in scripture and almost gloss over it. Fathers, parents, adults in the church who are helping raise our little ones. Holiness, justice, righteousness is the truth. 
and it must not be watered down to make others happy. But mercy and grace and covenant love is how we treat somebody and care about somebody who really is not living the way they should because that's how God treats us and loves us even though we don't deserve it. Often what people try to do is, well, if we water this down, it's easier to do this. How that leaves a sour taste in the mouth of our God. God's righteousness and justice and holiness must not be diluted. And we are called to be like him. Scripture says to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. To do justice, stand on the truth and do not waver. To love mercy means when you love something, well, you run after it. Some of the older guys here, when you were younger, and there was a young lady who's probably sitting next to you right now, or, or maybe she's at home or whatever, but you ran after her. Your children whom you love, especially if they're in danger, you run after them. Mercy, you run after it. You do justice, you stand on truth, you do not delude it, but you run after, you, you run after, you care about, you want so desperately that you are going to move in the direction of mercy, love. It takes you moving, getting off your seat. There are people in this room right now who need some mercy. From some people in this room, I need some mercy. I'm going to tell you right now, some people have not given it. Run after mercy, love. And how do we do that? Walking humbly before our God, knowing that he's on the throne and not us. Knowing that it's his throne and not our throne. Knowing that his ways are not our ways, last week's sermon. And that's okay because he's God and we're not. Amen. The rich and the poor, God made them all. We're hearing two extremes. There are some that are very wealthy in this room, and I'm not talking about finances. There are some in this room who are very wealthy in their relationship to God. There are some in this room who have a deep inner working of the Holy Spirit and their lives are, are wealthy in God. And there are some in this room who are struggling. There are some in this room who maybe they think they're wealthy, but they're not. And maybe they know they're not wealthy. Lord, I just don't see you when I need to. Lord, I need to hear you and I don't. God's reminding us that he is still present. He is the Lord over all. I'm going to share with you a miracle that happened this morning. I told you that I'm having a rough day. So there's no, no secret there now. It's out of the bag. And my kids are good to me. We had a great family breakfast. And, but I'm having a rough weekend, actually. And as I'm driving to church, actually not wanting to be here. Yeah, elders are allowed to have those feelings, too. My phone goes ding. And it's a text. It's a text from a young man who's about 27 years old who quite honestly, I didn't think that I was that big of an influence in his life. And it was a happy Father's Day. Over the years, you've shared things with me. Thank you. You're one of the fathers in my life. And he said a lot of other things, but I won't say those. I needed that. I needed that this morning. 
We have a God when you stand in need. He is the God over the rich and the poor. We have a God who is over all. So when you think you need him and when you don't think you need him, when you are impoverished, and I'm not talking finances, although that's part of it too, because he's faithful. Train up our children. Do they see that in your life? The title of this morning's message is, what does the world see? But more, what's more important, what do our children, your children see? And these are your children. You made the covenant when they were baptized. Your children are not just your biological children. Your children are not just your grandchildren. Your children are all the children of the body of Christ that we've made a covenant over. Train up our children in the way they should go. Do they see in your life the character in verse 1? Do they see in your life the acknowledgement that God is sovereign over the poor and over the rich, that he is over them all? If they don't see that, are you hiding it? Or my question is, are you not living it? Because if you've got it, you're either hiding it or you don't got it. And our kids need it. The prudent sees the danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Prudent, wise. There are some movies that I ought not to watch. And most of the time I'm wise enough and sometimes I'm not. There was a point in my life years ago where pornography had a hold on my life. And there are some places on the computer I ought not go, because if I go, I will be in trouble. And by God's grace, there was forgiveness, and that is past. But the truth is, there are places in all of our lives that we ought not go. There are places in all of our lives that lead us to the edge of making bad decisions, having bad things in our hearts and our minds. And the question is, do we say, well, if I go this close, I'm okay. If I go any further, I'm falling. The prudent, the wise, says, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. And for some of us, it's different things than other individuals in this own body. As elders yesterday, we had a conversation, uh, not just as elders, but as men in the breakfast Bible study, we talked about alcohol. And I'm going to pick on Thomas for a moment. You know I like picking on Thomas. And Thomas likes picking on me. It is a two-way street. As you know, we have a church barbecue. Now, in my household, we are not drunkards, honest, but we don't mind at times having a glass of wine with our meal or when it's a beautiful hot day, sitting outside, and if you've been to the farm, it's a nice place to sit and having a nice cold beer. We're, we're not opposed to it. And so at the last barbecue, Thomas walks up to me and says, hey, Dad, do you want a beer? And I said, no, this is a church barbecue. Not because I'm trying to hide it. If I was trying to hide it, I just did a bad job of it just now. <laughs> Not because I'm trying to hide it, but because one, it would be offensive to some other people. And two, there are some people who struggle with that. So as we're having this men's breakfast Bible study, we're talking about grace and mercy and justice, holiness, righteousness. And one of the older gentlemen who was there said, you know what? I'm a teetotaler. I just stay away from it because that's best for me. And you know what? That's respected. And that same individual said, but there's nothing wrong if, you know, if somebody wants to have a glass of wine with their meal or a, a, a cold can of beer on a hot sunny day, that's fine. But that's not for me. Wise, prudent, 
might be a little different for each person. You might be able to sit down on a computer and bounce all over the place and have no problems. I better not. So the reality is, are you listening to the Spirit of God? The reality is, are you reminding yourself, as in the second verse that we read, that God is sovereign? Are you listening for His voice in your life? Fathers, men in this church, are we teaching our children to listen to God, to be cautious, to look and say, you know what? That's an area I ought not go. The world, I'm going to tell you right now, the world is getting what it deserves. The world has chosen to call evil good and good evil, and there's unintended consequences that are hitting the culture right now that the culture doesn't even like. But they set the stage for the problems. With this whole world of transgender, gender fluidity, there are problems that are creeping up that even individuals who thought that was a good idea are now saying, I don't know if this is such a good idea anymore. Where it's leading. What we've done in our culture, it sounded great on the surface years ago to say, well, an unwanted pregnancy, let's just kind of, you know, it's an unwanted child and that poor child will grow up in an unloving home and so it's loving to, it's only a little bit and then we realize how many millions of children we've aborted and we realize that children are not now more valued, they are devalued in our culture. Human beings are not more valuable now, they are less valuable because we do not see them as made in the image of God. And the unintended consequences of sin is more sin. The unintended consequences of closing our eyes to God's way and putting ourselves on the throne is disaster and damnation. That is the truth. The intended consequences that God had by giving us law was not so that we had no fun, but that we would have our lives in abundance. Yes, that we would have our lives in fullness. I'll use a quick example. My grandmother, on my dad's side, loved candy. She loved sweets. And when you met her, this tall and this round, you could tell it. You could tell it. And God bless her, when she was about 92 years old, and the big box of chocolates were sitting on the table, and my dad was trying to take it away from her, she said, I'm 92. Leave me alone. <laughs> Leave me alone. And you know what? She was right. She was right. At 92, let her alone. But my grandmother did struggle with health throughout her whole life. She really did not eat in balance and exercise in balance. And because of that, she really never played with me. She could never keep up with me. I have a little bit of energy, as some of you know. And I grieve that because my other grandmother, taught me how to cook. I learned how to sew. I made dolls. My other grandmother would take me down to the beach and go into the water with me. And, and my other grandmother was constantly thinking about, not so preoccupied that it, it bothered her life, but constantly was preoccupied with, how can I be all God wants me to be? Now, I love both of my grandmothers, and they are both two wonderful ladies, and I look forward to being in heaven with both of them, because both of them knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But it was obvious to me that one of my grandmothers, she had her life revolve around, Lord, whatever you say, it's not about me, I'll do what you say. And my other grandmother was, I like what I like. And I want what I want. And I'll do what I please then. What are we showing our children? Go ahead, Pastor. What are we teaching our children? Who is on the throne? I want to go to the edge because I like it. If 
God says, don't go there. Don't go near there. And some of you might be called to places that others can't go. I've shared before, I knew a pastor who went to a bar every Friday and sat down and studied for his sermon at a bar. And that was an odd place to study for a sermon. And his reason for being there with the, the glasses clinking and the beer being poured was he was looking for opportunities to share Christ. I know other pastors who struggle with the drink and they ought not use that as an excuse for evangelism. Not every one of us are designed the same way and called to have the same ministry and not every father in this room or mother in this room is called to be the exact same template of activity. But we are all called to point our children in the way they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And if we don't do that, we are failing our God. What are the things that you ought to run away from? And let your kids know, I, I don't want to go there. It's not the place I want to go. Because it won't honor God. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. The reward for humility and fear. The reward for knowing that God is on the throne and it's his desires, not yours. And I've had some pastors who want to make this so earthly minded that they're no heavenly good. And what that means is they say, well, as long as I live for God, I'm going to be very, very wealthy. And so any poor person in my church is obvious they're not living for God. That is not what this is saying. The wealth that is being talked about here, the life that is being talked about here, the riches that are being talked about here are the relationship that you have with your father. There are wealthy families that you look at the relationship between the husband and the wife and you go, oh, that's pretty cold. You look at the relationship between the father and the children and they've got all the money and all the toys and all the camps and all the, the opportunities in the world. But the relationship between the dad and the children is non-existent. That's not the wealth God is talking about. That is not the wealth that we are hearing in God's word. God provides enough. I'm going to tell you what, he provides more than enough. Yes, he does. I don't know how, but I know why. Because he's a good father yes, he who loves his children. And so that family who... They're wondering where the next mortgage payment is going to come from. They're wondering where the next rent check is going to come from. They're wondering where the next meal is going to come from. That family might have far more wealth, far more riches than the person who's got a summer home here and a winter home there. My friends, what are our children seeing? If they're seeing that we are after that kind of wealth, they're probably not really seeing or feeling or understanding what true wealth and true riches are. Our culture has diminished the value of covenant relationships. Do you know what polyamory is? Polyamory is a brand new thing, but it's not. Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. Polyamory is a huge thing right now in our culture. And my guess is probably 90% of the people in this room have never heard of it. But if you talk to a high school student, they know exactly what this is. Polyamory is, well, the sanctity of marriage is out. Why not? Because the sanctity of life is out. The sanctity of gender is out. The sanctity of God's word has been off the table for quite a while in our culture. So, of course, the sanctity of marriage isn't going to be much. Polyamory has now become a big thing in our culture and with our young people. Multiple covenants and relationships where this husband has this wife, but he's got this girlfriend, and she knows about it because she's got this boyfriend, and they've also got this best friend here who they talk to, but this one over here they sleep with, and this, and this is all okay because it's all on the table. It's no longer secret, because secrets are naughty. At least our culture has something right. 
And polyamory is this idea of having open relationships that are committed relationships, and therefore it's good. No. That is not God's word. That is not God's plan. It's a great hedonistic, humanistic approach to life. But let's move God off the throne and do what we want. What are our children seeing and hearing? If we do not train them, if we do not teach them, they will be taught. Our church in September is starting Trail Life. Trail Life is this scouting, Christ-centered boys program. Trail Life, we've been asking you to pray for, that the Holy Spirit would go ahead of the program and start working on the hearts and minds of fathers and leaders and children, young boys, that they would be prepared to be touched by God in that program. Because if this program is about archery and campfire building and it stops there, then we have wasted our time. If this program is not about leading fathers and men and boys and families into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if it's not about that, then we ought not do it as a church. And I will tell you, what excited me was when I had to be interviewed, when I had to call the headquarters, they called me, and sit me down, figuratively speaking, because I'm on the phone, and they began to ask the questions. Does your church and do you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I'm like, wow. Yes. But that's pretty basic. Do you believe that God made man and woman? Period. Wow. That's countercultural. Yeah. Do you believe that marriage is one man and one woman? You know what? I'm not used to boys' programs and girls' programs and youth programs asking that level of question. And my heart leapt within me. Do you believe? And if you believe it, teach it. Train it. Or the culture will teach. And it is. One of the young people in this last year who worked with me the only reason I learned what polyamory was is because he told me. I hadn't heard it before. The young people who work for me, I have 18. I'm the oldest, of course, but 18 right on up. And here's an 18-year-old young man. And, you know, I'm often hearing about boyfriends and girlfriends. And he's talking, and then he's talking. And I'm like, oh, did you get a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend? Or, yeah, there was a whole world there. And he's like, oh, no, it's all one. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, I believe in polyamory. And then I began to ask, and everybody on my crew knew what it was. All the young people knew what it was. This is their new thing. Train up your children in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. I'm watching the clock and I realize I am under a clock. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. We've already talked about that, that our culture had unintended consequences. They even in the culture who think that wrong is right and right is wrong don't like how wrong it's going. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Think for a moment of the story of Esther and Haman. Haman built the gallows, not for himself, but for Mordecai. But he ended up on the gallows. Our culture does not always intend the consequences that come about. But when you step away from God's law, you will find that you fall further and further away from his grace. When our culture and our country steps away from God's law, we find that we fall further and further away from God being in the culture. We've asked God to step away. And some of us and some of our cultural institutions are finding that God is answering that prayer. And we as a church ought to be crying out louder than ever before. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you are slow to anger and steadfast in love. Lord, you are long suffering. Please, Lord. 
change this world. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. The crooked, the wicked are finding more and more that there is not peace on the road they have chosen. Whoever guards his soul will keep it far from them. That is you and I, that is our children. Whoever guards their soul, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. If we have respect for God's word, God's law, God's plan. And then the verse that we've been focusing on all morning. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. The verse in Deuteronomy, the passage, I'm not going to go verse by verse. But it has that odd portion where it talks about taking that phrase, the Lord your God is one, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. It has that phrase and it says, tell your children, teach your children when you lay down and you, when you rise up, when you walk with them, teach your children, bind it on your, 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 your arms, bind it on your frontal, put it on your doorposts. Conservative Jewish people actually do that. Very, very conservative Jewish people in their morning prayers take a little leather box with the scripture in it and they put it on them and they wrap it on them and they take a little leather box and they looks like a little headband and there's a little box sitting there with a piece of uh, scripture in it. And on their homes, if you've ever seen it, there's a, a little container that's got a piece of scripture in it. When they walk in their homes, they, they touch it. Those are all wonderful things if it reminds them truly of what's in it. You can do all that stuff and still not have God living within your heart. Do we put God in front of us all the time? And what that passage in Deuteronomy was saying was, whether you are lying down at night sleeping, now I lay me down to sleep. Do you remember the prayer? When you tuck your little ones in? I hope we still do something like that. When you lie down, when you rise up, do your children pray in the morning? Do you pray in the morning? When you are on your way, is God, do you have God on the brain? Is it there? I'm going to end with a, with a short story. Little boy in a sandbox. There's a big rock in the middle of the sandbox. And his dad is watching him play, and he's building little sand castles and stuff. And he decides to move the rock, and the rock is just too big. So he's pushing against it, pushing against it, and the rock doesn't move. And he sits down, and he puts his butt in the sand, and he pushes his legs against it, and it doesn't move. And the father comes over and goes, what's going on? Dad, I'm trying to move the rock, and I've done everything. There's no way to move the rock. You have not done everything. Oh, yes, I have. I've pushed with my shoulder. I've tried to lift it. I've tried to push with my legs. I've done everything. Everything. No, you haven't. You didn't ask for my help. And Dad walks into the sandbox and grabs a hold of the rock and picks it up and tosses it to the side. Dads, brothers and sisters in Christ, Training up our children is an impossible task. But not if you have God before you. Amen. On your frontals, on your foreheads, on your wrists, on your doorposts. When you lay down, when you rise up. You want your children, the children of this church, because they are your children. To know the Lord Jesus Christ? And what are they seeing? Who are you? Let's pray. Father, forgive us that we don't ask for your help enough to move the rocks so that there is a place for our children to grow and play and mature. Father, forgive us that we do not revolve our lives around the relationship that we ought to have with you. And how wonderful it is that you are a good and loving father and that no matter what, you are faithful. So in our failings, 
We cry out how great thou art because you are faithful. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As Kelly and Thomas come forward, I encourage you to turn to 404, Faith of Our Fathers. Hymn number 404. sing along, you are encouraged to do so. How great a father's love.
the gifts from your hands that we return back to you. That the name of Jesus Christ might be lifted up in this dark and dying world. And that people might know that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. At this time we continue in our congregational prayer. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. What a privilege it is to stand in front of such a great crowd of witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. The testimony in itself. First, I'd like to start off by praying for the church and the people that are here in worship and praying for the people that are not here in worship. And also our enemies, Lord. We know that prayer changes everything. So continue on praying without ceasing. And pray for the people that you don't like. And let them know that you love them. We might not. I'd like to pray for the congregational families. Uh, Bruce Bergman who always shares his ministry of photographs. He is such an inspiration, and we know that he loves the Lord and his creation. We pray for Alfred, Sandy, and Allison, and Christian Bergman. We pray for Jim's family. Jim, Heidi, James, Thomas, Aaron, Caleb, and Hannah. The ongoing prayers for May Lennon and, and her prayer service, Eleanor Ogden in the nursing home. We pray for Dennis and Regina Shealy, Francine Nikolowski. We won't forget her and Bill. Lorraine Hawthorburn, Scott Hill and Carol, and their daughter who is expecting a child, Matt Kindoff, James and Becky Kruger, and their kids, Christine Langberg, Cindy Ellison's mom. We pray for our first responders, and the people that are in the military service, Charles's granddaughter who just joined the Navy, knowing that she felt called to serve. And what a joy it is that we have an all-volunteer army that are willing to make the sacrifice for our freedom. also like to keep our missionaries in prayer. Evermore Williams. He's doing Christ's love in action, which should call us all to action. And I'd like to open up the floor for congregational prayers because we know that prayer is the most powerful thing this side of heaven. So feel free to offer up your praises and concerns. Father, we think of the Kruger family in a special way. They've lost a 
few members of the family in the last two weeks. And there was sickness and struggle. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we just lift up James and Becky and each member of their family as they are experiencing trials and tribulations. But more than that, they are your children. And you are a good father. So wrap your arms around them in a, in a way that they understand and can see today. Yes, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I just, uh, I'm so thankful that I've still got my father. And Lord, I think of him especially today. I haven't been able to see my father for two years because he lives so far away. COVID, but I just pray your blessings upon him. I pray that you'll give my sister the strength that she needs to continue to give him the help of love and care that he needs. And God, if he lives to see October, he'll be 97. And then too, again, I no, uh, I know James and Becky, and I know that her uncle just passed away, Richard Lamar. Um, I know him, and I know his wife, Lillian. So, Lord, I just pray that you'll give them peace yes. and comfort. Yes, Lord. And uh, I know they were faithful members of the Salvation Army. So Lord be with them. I pray all this in Christ's name. Father, I thank you for the healing and the strength that you've given to Jim. And the healing and the strength that you've given to my wife, Valerie. I praise your name you and I praise and bless you because of your faithfulness and your goodness. Be reminded that an unspoken prayer is still answered. If it's in your mind and you didn't verbalize it, God understands. Know that he's already there. If there's no other prayers from the congregation, I'd like to ask you to stand. we recite the Lord's Prayer in unison, know that uh, Jesus' disciples really weren't sure how they were to pray. So they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And that means that we really don't know how to pray or what to pray for. But the Lord knows that we're going to get exactly what we deserve and no more and no less. Let me begin by saying, Our Father, Our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How great thou art. Do our children see that? That we believe our God is mighty and wonderful. This was the favorite hymn of Mr. McVicker. He showed his children how great a God we have. So as we sing it together, let's sing it to our Heavenly Father. Hymn number 147. I see the stars, I hear the voice. 